So you guys have plenty of time. I think we have, we're almost at 40. So I think, yeah, we'll let people trickle in. Okay, great. All right, hi everyone. Um, welcome to another COVID seminar. Um, today we are very honored to have double MD PhD speakers. Um, I'll guess, I guess I'll introduce them in the order they're gonna be speaking. Um, so Dr. Manish Boot, um, who's a uh, uh, Richard Stein uh, Endowed Chair and Associate Professor of uh, Pediatrics at UCLA. He's also the Division Chief of Immunology, Allergy and Rheumatology. Um, I would say, um, uh, since I knew, um, since I met Manish, um, he's um, uh, really talented in two, two things uh, that are very, that made an impression on me. I One only, is that- Only two things. <laughs> Well, I can. I only have time to talk about two things. Is that um, he's he he has done lots of uh, he has done training in lots of different fields and and just um, extraordinary in bringing multiple fields together in his research, and also his talent in introducing speakers usually with poetry that he writes. Um, so uh, I apologize that today my intro will not be able to meet up to Manisha <laughs> High Standard, but. Um, he studied physics um, and earned his MD in Brown University. Then he studied structural biology at UCSF and um, uh, earned his PhD in biophysics. Then he went on to do a pediatrics residencies at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, and a clinical fellowship in allergy and immunology at Boston Children's Hospital. He then did um, his postdoc research um, at Harvard and worked on T cell pathways and chemistry. He was first a faculty at Stanford University, and then we were lucky to uh, recruit him to UCLA in late 2016. He's very passionate about T cells, um, and he's, his lab studies T cells in the context of infections, autoimmunity, and cancer. Um, he's also very passionate about improving the diagnosis and tr uh, treatment of patients with rare genetic immune diseases. Um, again, I see no better person than uh, Manish to study um, the topic that he's going to talk about today. Um, we're also very honored to have Dr. Dan Gershwin uh, here with us today. Um, I don't think I have to give too much of an introduction since Dan is one of the world's experts on autism um, and he, his lab has contributed uh, with uh, lots of publications and um, and because of that, he's also a member of the American Association of Physicians and member of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, he is the Gordon and Virginia McDonald Distinguished Professor of Human Genetics, Neurology and Psychiatry. He's the Director of Center for Autism Research and Treatment at Semmel Institute here at UCLA. He's also the Senior Associate Dean and Associate Vice Chancellor of Precision Health Institute, where he oversees campus precision health uh, in initiatives. And his work um, focuses on identifying genetic factors that cause autism spectrum disorder and understanding the genetic mechanism um, of, of the disease. And uh, again, um, we are really excited to um, your talk, uh, Dan and Manish, and uh, please take it away. Thanks, Audie. Uh, and, and although two of us just got in, uh, introduced, uh, I want to make sure that we uh, acknowledge that the third faculty that you see on the screen here, who is uh, sine qua non for this entire project, uh, is Bogdan Pasnuik, who is a professor in uh, pathology and laboratory medicine, computational medicine, and, uh, and human genetics, I think, also. And you'll see much of the work that his group has contributed to this project uh, intercalated throughout the project. He has truly uh, been one of the core faculty right from the beginning of trying to identify um, the host genetic factors that result in COVID-19 susceptibility, which is what we're going to talk about today. And uh, while we're in the business of uh, giving credit, oops, um, I want to make sure that we acknowledge the people who actually helped make a lot of the data that you'll see on these slides, including uh, three PhD students in, in Bogdan's lab, uh, Ruthie, Yi, and Tomer. Uh, Timothy Chang, who works uh, closely with Dan in Dan's lab and also now is a junior faculty in the Department of Neurology. Uh, Alexis, who works in pediatrics and who has been uh, uh, absolutely essential to obtaining and moving samples around, getting consents, IRB protocols, and everything. And then Paul Boutros, uh, who is uh, well known to everyone in the JCCC um, computational side of cancer genomics, 
and who has uh, been helping with a lot of the analysis of these data. Uh, and funding for a lot of the projects, as you can see here, came from, uh, from the generous internal sources of funding, and we're hoping someday to get external sources of funding as we move into larger and larger efforts to identify these genes and pathways. We also have gotten some uh, very kind in, in kind and or discounted uh, uh, sequencing done from Helix and Illumina uh, along the ride. Okay, so let's jump in to talk about COVID by talking about other infections, because I, I think the, um, that as COVID, as scary as COVID is uh, in terms of the, what you see on the news every day and what you re read in the, on, on your websites, uh, the reality is that COVID actually fits into a larger pattern of infection and human responses to infection uh, that is seen even among, for example, the great killers of humans. Uh, malaria, tuberculosis, things that we know slay thousands if not millions of people every year, um, turn out actually to have a very low infection fatality rate or, or case fatality rate as it may be, uh, as we may have data for. For example, plasmodium infection infects tens of millions of people, 10 million alone in India, but only about 0.01% uh, of those who infected die. Uh, tuberculosis, another great killers of humans, only actually infects about 10% of the people who are exposed. And uh, the mortality rate among those infected is only about 2%. So the infection fatality rate is about 0.2%. Even Spanish flu, uh, which killed hundreds of millions of people, uh, we don't know what the exact infection fatality rate, but um, it may be a, an upper bound estimate of around 3%. Uh, the other things that we know and hospitalize people for and treat with antibiotics and watch them die uh, and or live in our hospitals, staph, strep, Canada, other major pathogens, all have a much lower infection fatality rate uh, than these numbers here. And SARS-CoV-2 infection, COVID-19, fits right in alongside. Uh, we know now from data from the United States, from the CDC and, um, um, and, and other countries that the infection fatality rate for this particular viral infection is uh, right around 03 to 0.5%. That is to say, 99.6% of the people who get this infection are not going to die. Why is it that some people are more susceptible to some infections than others? Uh, why is it that some people have much worse outcomes than others? Uh, COVID-19 is a ex great example. Some people, half the people at least, are totally asymptomatic. They don't even know they have it. And uh, a tiny portion of people, as you can see from these numbers, go on to die from it uh, and die typically within 20 or 30 days. So this is a, a great heterogeneity of infection outcomes. The inter-individual variability uh, is what we're interested in. So I'll give you some hypotheses as to why inter-individual variability occurs. For example, you may say that there's some acquired defect that these patients have in their immune system. They're all malnourished in these, in these villages, and that's why Africa, in Africa, the, some uh, you know, uh, pathogen like malaria can come through and kill a bunch of people, or Zika in the, in, in the uh, impoverished parts of South America. Uh, but even among those populations where everyone's sort of equally malnourished, you only find a tiny proportion of those populations die from infection. Um, what about microbial variation? Like, is there some worse microbe than other? Is that why COVID-19 is so, better, so much better in some, uh, some corners of the world than others, in some corners of, of LA than others? Uh, yes, certainly we know that certain flu strains over time will uh, undergo changes, genomic changes that allow them to become more pathogenic than others. And certainly over time then, microbial variation does represent a reasonable hypothesis as to why there's inter-individual variability in outcomes to infection. But typically not during a single outbreak. We know that, uh, for example, the strains that affect uh, the East Coast or the West Coast are mostly similar enough that it's hard to say why we have such different outcomes uh, in some parts and among even some households. Uh, what about the level of inoculum, like some uh, workers, healthcare workers or teachers, or maybe they're getting a higher inoculum in infection, maybe that's why they get sicker. That really does not appear from the data um, that we have so far about COVID-19 to explain it, or really for any other infection. Uh, although probably, certainly, the more bug that's blown into your body, the worse your outcome will be. Uh, we know, for example, in this uh, one well-documented case where infants were injected with live tuberculosis bacteria instead of BCG vaccine uh, in 1929. Uh, of the 251 infants who got injected with a very well-measured dose of TB bacteria, that is to say the level of inoculum was fixed, uh, still only a, a small portion, now in this case 30% or so, died from the infection and the other 70% did just fine. So um, the the idea here that it is an acquired defect or that something's changing about the bug, or maybe you've got more bug than others, 
maybe these are all sort of hinting in the right direction as to explain why there might be differences in outcome, but it's not enough. It's certainly not enough. Uh, and more importantly, the, the bigger conclusion that we get is that um, these pathogens, whether malaria or TB or SARS-CoV-2, as I showed in the last slide, um, largely our immune system is actually incredibly successful at keeping our, our species alive, despite these great slayers of humanity coming our way year upon year. Um, however, on an individual level, the immune system may not be so great at keeping any one individual alive. Uh, it seems that the evolutionary pressures on our genome have allowed uh, the immune system to keep the population alive. Now, we wouldn't know that on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, as much as um, in the prehistoric era, people were dying left and right from infection. Uh, in the modern era, people just aren't dying from infection that much because we have so much human progress, clean water, clean air, et cetera. Um, and in fact, in Paleolithic times, pre prehistoric times, we know that the average survival about half the people died by the time they were five, and certainly the 50 percentile for survival was hit by the time people were 20. Uh, and so we don't see anything like that in any population of the world today because of human progress. So we don't really remember that there is uh, some susceptibility, even life-threatening susceptibility, uh, baked into each of our genomes because we typically aren't seeing people dying of infection around us. So if it's not uh, the, in the bugs variation that's the cause of all this stuff, what is it? Well, Obviously, the human, the host genome is the cause. And there are adoption studies and twin studies, which are sort of the, 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 the crucible by which a lot of uh, hypotheses are tested against their genetic basis uh, that, have been, uh, that have been borne out for infection susceptibility to having a genetic basis. Uh, for example, in tuberculosis studies, where you take monozygotic twins, uh, where the babies come from the same and they're genetically identical, or dizygotic twins, where they are not, they're fraternal. Uh, the, the susceptibility to tuberculosis is highly inherited based on such uh, factors. And, and in a study that was done in, uh, in Scandinavia where adopted parents, uh, parents adopt out children to other households. And if they go on to dying by infection, you'll find that their children who are living in a totally different household from them their whole lives, their children go on to dying pr uh, preferentially disproportionately to, due to infection. Whereas all the other causes of dying of the, the parents who adopted out the kid and the kid who um, died, uh, there is no significant increase. Uh, for example, in cancer, if the parents died from cancer, the child dying from cancer is not disproportionately higher than chance. It's only from infection that you see this uh, genetic inheritance so powerful. Okay, so genetic variation is likely the cause of inter-individual variation to out infection outcomes. What about COVID? Is, is the genes, are the genes really important for its susceptibility to COVID? Uh, certainly you see in the press every day, whether it's in Science Magazine or in popular science magazines like the Scientists or Scientific American, uh, this is now coming up again and again to try to ask this question over and over again. Are our genes making us sick uh, and leading us to down this uh, path of, of dying or getting very sick from infection? So the way we're tackling this question is, um, is two. We're gonna look for uh, genes that confer susceptibility or resistance to COVID that are rare genes, rare variants that occur in rare individuals that really damage the cellular function quite a bit, that are highly penetrant, almost Mendelian in their penetrance. But um, because they're so rare, they typically don't explain a lot of people dying. They may explain a small number of people dying in the population. And we're gonna look at common variants, common variants that occur in common people. They may not actually massively define a functional defect in some cell or pathway. Uh, and because these pathways are not so impairing, they actually individually don't contribute to a large, lot of risk. But because they occur commonly across the population, they may actually add up to an attributable risk. So Dan is gonna start off by talking about common variants and how uh, we're going after that. Do you want to take this? Yeah, thanks, Manish. Oops. I'm just going to get my screen up. Looks good. Can you guys see that? Yep. Great. And I just want to just further emphasize that this has been a fantastic collaboration. It's just extraordinary working with these guys. And most of my work has been to provide infrastructure and you know some some biomedical input, um, but it's just uh, you know Bogdan's lab has done an extraordinary job just in general mobilizing the medical records for research, and we'll discuss a little bit of that as we go through. Um, so, you know, just to emphasize, 
I think about this not as in a as complicated a way, a sophisticated a way as 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 Manish is, and and um, you know I'm wondering. Um, oh, start my video. Thank you. Yeah, can you guys see me? Yeah, and so um, not um, so um, you know, let's just you know if we make it very very simple, infection susceptibility, the host factors, you know whether you get infected and it, and and we can detect it. Your clinical course, which is also related to your outcome, but the clinical course being, you know, do you have severe pulmonary issues uh, requiring critical care, cardiac, neuro, et cetera, coagulopathy, and then kind of outcome, we can look, especially in these very large biobank related studies, um, we have to look at more uh, general phenotypes like hospitalization or death. So we started almost immediately um, um, a host genomics registry at UCLA, we got an IRB protocol, and again, Arash Naeem and the CTSI played a big role. And I just want to emphasize not just the funding from the School of Medicine and the Broad Stem Cell Research Center, but we're able to do this because we had a lot of infrastructure from Precision Health as well, as well as just connections with the CTSI that enabled us to really move uh, more quickly than we otherwise would have been able to. And so our kind of goal when we wrote this uh, proposal um, led by Bogdan and Manish to uh, the, the Broad Stem Cell um, and, and the School of Medicine for funding was, let's start with 500 patients, knowing that um, that's a very small number when we talk about genetic and genomic studies and uh, that we're gonna um, have to increase that, but we view that as a beachhead. Um, perhaps other genetic assays, you know, as we apply for funding. And um, we're part of a UC-wide consortium. And we actually have played a pretty big role in organizing the other campuses in collectively sharing and enrolling patients and getting them sequenced. And then another key issue because of the power that we need is that we're, a, um, we're, we're uh, contributing to two different initiatives that are global that I'll, that I'll discuss in a moment. So again, our aims are to perform whole exome sequencing and genotyping. We've actually, because of the um, in-kind donation from Illumina, we're actually able to do whole genome sequencing. Um, and uh, they, they're paying for half the cost. And, and um, we're gonna do, you know, there are kind of two basic aims as Manish pointed out, the common and the rare, and they kind of require uh, slightly different approaches. This is a slide from Bogdan that really describes uh, these efforts. And again, Manish is the connection to this, what's called the COVID human genetic effort. And I marvel at the beautiful graphics here in their little, um, uh, that's the best part of the effort so far. And you can see it's places from all around the world that are contributing. And there we are all the way on the left coast. And then um, um, we're, we joined, because our biobank, had joined a global biobank initiative to kind of pool data because again, large sample sizes are necessary um, and, and really increase power to identify common genetic and rare genetic variation. That um, the idea here was to start by identifying common loci that modulate risk and severity in the general population. And so you can see us in the little red dot over here um, through our biobank. Now, we're not doing this in a total vacuum. In fact, there, you probably heard of a published GWAS, and this is the one in New England Journal of Medicine from the Italian and Spanish cohorts. It's a total of about, I think it's 1,600 cases from both and about a little over 2,000 controls. Um, and it has to do with those with respiratory failure and those without. And um, there's a locus that you can see on chromosome uh, three and one um, at the ABO locus. The, uh, this is a classic Manhattan plot that just uh, pools, uh, shows that plots the data by chromosome and the negative log 10p value on the y-axis with the red line being the uh, genome-wide significant um, five times 10 to the minus eight. And the ABO, and I just wanna show you something here I think is very, whoops, if it shows, let's see. Oh, it disappeared. Well, you're going to have to believe me then. I don't know. Uh, that was um, a, a uh, PowerPoint uh, snafu, but um, 
this, none of these are significant in either sample alone, but combined at about 1,600 patients, this is the combined result. The ABO, however, when it's done in a model that controls for sex and age, is not genome-wide significant. And I think it was not replicated in another study. So this one remains less certain. The other one is pretty strong and remains even higher when controlling for sex and age, which are major risk factors. So again, as I mentioned, we're a key contributor. We've leveraged the Atlas Biobank, um, uh, which has, so we have both remnant samples from patients who were genotyped and we've saved already, who turned out to get COVID. We've collected about 30,000 of our patients already and a small, very small percentage had COVID. And then we've been uh, trying to collect all the COVID positive tested in patients. Again, this has been a strong collaboration with our biobank and pathology, as well as starting to collect people who come in to give convalescent plasma. And the sample handling workflow was adapted. Uh, Chris Denny spent, and Arash Naeem and Clara Magyar and Dawn Ward spent a lot of time um, overseeing this and getting it going. And again, I, I really think without this infrastructure, uh, infrastructure isn't sexy, but I just want to emphasize this really allowed us to move much more quickly. Um, and then the de-identified, this was uh, been a longstanding collaboration with OHIA and the health system informatics. We already had um, a de-identified data repository resource uh, containing more than a million and a half patients that we can look at as well as a COVID repository. So before I show our kind of initial genetic results, I just want to give, I, I apologize to the geneticists among us, but I wanted to give a, a little primer in a way, because uh, many of us who went to med school or in graduate school might have forgotten uh, some of the basic genetics. I want to make sure we're on the same page and kind of give you a perspective. So Humans have grown quickly from very small ancestral populations. And so we're all kind of, this is from my favorite genetic source, Wikipedia. And, and the plot is shown here. All, you know, this is the world in blue. So uh, kind of from 10,000 BC to the present day. We can see that there's been a recent huge population growth in the last, uh, you know, 500 years or so. So what this means is, you know, aside, you know, so um, the, what it means is that if, if we're looking at kind of present day, which is shown here kind of at the bottom, you know, uh, you know, people, he, you know, um, that, um, that we all share quite a bit of common genetic variation. In other words, things that are present in our genome, more than 5%, those come from common ancestors that are way back here because that things that have large negative effects on survival or disease, causing disease, will be weeded out after a few generations. And so the things that we share in common as a population are ancient, and the things that have very, very large effects are usually newer. In fact, things are often de novo, that is um, not in the parent and just happening in the germline. And so those will have large effects and um, so if one's looking for GWAS, a genome-wide association, what one is doing is taking advantage of the fact that most of us share about 90% of our heterozygous variation is common and arose more than 10,000 years ago. However, within this kind of whole world population, we also, there have been bottlenecks and there's been some assorted of mating so that Ashkenazi Jews and other, other populations that have intermarried you know, have, have their own also population specific gen uh, uh, genetics, even, even, you know, African ancestry, Asian ancestry, and kind of admixed Americans, which are usually self-identified as Hispanic or Latino, will also have their own kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, population specific, but yet common variation. But this common variation has been acted upon by natural selection to remove strong bad actors so that the effect sizes of these individual variants and these loci on disease risk are going to be small. It's not like a, uh, a lightning bolt. It's, it's like, a, you know, it's a much smaller kind of effect. And actually, you know, again, just so, you know, when we think about this, if we have high frequency, 
they're going to have low effects. And as effect size get larger, they're going to have small, you know, with a few uh, exceptions. And so we do SNP genotyping to look for polymorphisms that are present in more than 1% of the population that are contributory. And then we also do the sequencing, which allows you to identify causal larger effect mutations, or let's just call them larger effect. Um, and so because we know we've already surveyed all this common variation, we have you know, $30 chips that can actually genotype essentially 500,000 to a million variants very, very cheaply and in all these different populations. And that's, what, that's our input to the GWAS. Whereas if we wanna start looking for rare variation that isn't present commonly, we have to do sequencing in general. And, and just to show you, this is a slide from one of my colleagues, Jonathan Flint from a long time ago, but it just basically kind of proves this. If we look at GWAS effect size distributions in terms of the odds ratio of an individual variant, one can see that the vast majority have you know, um, a kind of odds ratio uh, below two. In fact, most are below 1.2. It's kind of rare to be out here. And, and, you know, essentially the basics of how this is done is a really simple kind of variant um, of, a, of a kind of case control study. So you have patients with the disorder or patients who are severe COVID versus not severe or versus the population, you test these genetic markers and you're basically looking to see if there's a difference in the frequency in the cases of controls. Here I'm showing autistic because I work on autism as was introduced and one can see that in this particular case, there's something that's twice as frequent in the autistic cases. Now, if you only had five autistic cases and 10 controls, this wouldn't be that substantial. But if you have thousands, this starts to get very significant. Again, the need for large sample sizes and thus our kind of um, um, involvement in all of these um, uh, uh, international consortium, which are gonna be essential to replicate and identify robust associations. In fact, Prior to the GWAS error, there are a lot of candidate gene studies, and you know we can look at candidate genes, but we have to look at them in a genome-wide context. There was a lot of kind of noise and unreplicated findings, and so these large sample sizes are, are necessary. The phenotype definitions that we're using at first are ones that are decided on by the international consortium. Of course, we can do our own local analyses as our sample grows. Um, I hope it doesn't grow. Um, but if it does, um, you know, we'd like to genotype everybody. So we have analysis A, which is very severe kind of respiratory symptoms. We have B, that's hospitalized versus non-hospitalized. And we have C, that's essentially those who have COVID versus those that test negative. Now, when we look within the population at UCLA that, that we've collected so far, Fortunately, at some level, from a met, you know, population health standpoint, it's not that many people. It's 465. Right now, I think we're up to 517. So um, it's been low impact in the West Side. If you look, what I'm showing here is an ancestry breakdown that is not self-reported ancestry. This is ancestry from genotypes. But I will say that this correlates very, very significantly with self-reported ancestry. So that and, and one can see that most of our patients, but it, it's not the majority, I, the largest group is European, but there's no majority, which is a, actually really great for genetic studies to be able to really have this diverse population. It allows us to do a lot of things, including admixture mapping, which I'll allude to at the end. But these AMR are actually admixed Americans, which correspond to people who self-identify as Hispanic. It really looks at the kind of percentage of kind of a uh, older East Asian slash indigenous um, um, genotypes. Um, so, so, you know, so that's a really, really key point um, that this is, and so how do we figure this out? Like, how do we know this? Well, what you can do is you take the genotypes and you take their principal components. And that's shown on the next slide. And I'm just showing the first five. We usually look at the first 10 or 20, so always the first 10. And what one can see is the different populations colored um, by what we know they are from looking at the 10, you know, at 10,000 genomes, 1,000 genomes population. So these have been defined already for us. So we just apply the labels based on the genetics. 
and one can see the East Asians up here on the first, and, and, and here are um, African, and these are European. And this principal component three is the uh, American admixture here, shown here as well. And so um, the point is that you could, this is telling us that the major sources of variance in the data are our ancestry. So when we do these studies, we actually have to control very clearly for ancestry. You could imagine in that kind of very, very basic cartoon chi-square kind of thing that I showed you, if the cases have a different genetic background than the controls, they might have a different frequency of certain alleles. And therefore, that would be a confounding factor. And so we control for that. One of the things that we do right now, as we're just starting, is we just do the GWAS separately in each population. And we're only doing it in those that have over 100 cases. So we've only done it in the European and, um, and the admixed Americans so far. Hopefully that makes sense. So it's also interesting, aside from the confounding issues of ancestry, we, we've all read on the news, if we've been paying attention, that those with self-reported Hispanic ancestry are overrepresented, younger, and had lower rates of comorbidities among those who were hospitalized with COVID. It's similar for African Americans who were SARS-CoV-2 positive. Both groups have more severe courses. And so the question is, is that a sociodemographic healthcare disparity issue or is that underlying genetics? Now we can also look in our own medical records. A lot of this is kind of countywide, non-individual data. We have our own medical records on this and we can look through this and this is something that Tim um, Chang, along with, um, you know, with Ruthie and other folks in, um, in Bogdan's lab did, um, you know, basically looking at the demographics of our COVID patients. And so there's a lot of information here. I don't have a lot of time. So I'm just gonna mention, you can see that of the tested COVID patients all the way on the right, 6% were African-American, but of those with severe, that is um, ICU, hospital is a, you know, ICU course, um, it's double. Hispanic Latino, 15% um, um, tested, 28% positive, 38% inpatient, and almost half of the, uh, of the ICU cases. I will also tell you that this number tested reflects the demographics of our patients when we look either by those that were, we look by genotyping or we look by self-reported ancestry of our, in, our, in this DDR data mart, it's about 6% African-American, 16% Hispanic, Latino, et cetera. So, so the number tested is kind of fairly parallel with the percent patients that we have here at UCLA. So this is, you know, so the, they have a more severe course and there's a, uh, we, we have to get to the bottom, you know, why that is. So I'm just gonna show you a few GWAS results. So here's hospitalized versus non-hospitalized COVID positive. And what I'm showing you there is expected versus uh, observed. And uh, one looks for a lambda that is one or around one, which this is, which is an inflation score because uh, you don't wanna have this uh, kind of all the way above the line. But what happens is when you get a positive result, it starts to kind of eke up out here towards the top. So cases versus controls, that's European patients. This is the admixed um, Americans, very, very similar. Now, if we just look at those that are positive versus tested negative, or did, it's very similar for the general population. So now not severity, just COVID positive. We begin to see some hint of signal. In fact, in the American, which is a smaller cohort, there is one genome-wide significant locus, but we have to take that with a grain of salt because again, it might be some issue of admixture and things. And so we have to do some QC. This is hot off the press. It's only about a week old. So, so I wouldn't put too much stock in this, but I, but I think this inflation, uh, not inflation, but the, 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 um, these points off the line here um, observe, you know, uh, are intriguing, but, but still very preliminary. Um, but the idea is now Bogdan's group has submitted these 
and now we're part of this much larger GWAS consortium. And because uh, you know it's a total of about 500 and something patients that have now been genotyped, it's almost as large as the Italian or Spanish cohort that was used in that New England Journal of Medicine paper, although it's admixed ancestries, which weakens it somewhat, but also has, has some other advantages that we can discuss if we have time. So this is kind of, to me, um, very intriguing. We observe a greater than twofold risk for inpatient hospitalization, even after controlling for known comorbid risk factors shown there in the, those that are um, Hispanic. This is based on genetic um, ancestry, the admixed Americans. And we can see that even with age, sex, known risk factors at the bottom, inpatient versus outpatient, 2.5, positive versus negative, 2.5. And the question is, is this, again, a healthcare disparity or some other sociodemographic issue? Um, um, or is this, uh, you know, related, you know, you know, somehow being, you know, related to underlying genetic risk? Now, we, we don't know that yet. But as a first step, we can actually ask, does this, does the amount, does you, uh, an ind each one of these dots is an individual patient? This is their loading on that individual PC so that those out here have the greatest American, you know, admixed ancestry. And so one can ask, does your um, proportion of, of, of ancestry um, as, as captured by this uh, third PC relate to, uh, to uh, COVID risk? And if we look at those just are positive versus the other population, it ends up being quite significant. Now, it's a preliminary result that needs confirmation. And it doesn't prove that this is genetic because the amount of admixture could be a surrogate for other things that are kind of hidden confounders. Um, and again, other sociodemographics that we have to, have to weed out and look at. But it is, um, without seeing this, we couldn't, you know, we would not expect any genetic contribution. So at least this is, this is going in a direction that suggests there could be one. And so um, before I hand off to Manish, I'll just um, summarize that we've, you know, this is a progress report. We really just got started on this um, in the late spring. We operationalize a pipeline to collect patients. We've collected a hundred additional samples from UCSD and UC Davis and UCI, um, um, and we've actually been able to help lead this effort. We're in the process of sequencing all 500, it's now 617 or so, um, 200 have been sent. You know, this is all in process. Um, uh, the algorithmic pipelines for extracting meaningful COVID phenotypes has been um, set up. Um, again, we have this UC-wide collaboration that's very exciting, as well as these international efforts. And so, I, I want to pass off to, to uh, Manish, who's going to talk about the kind of rationale um, and, and some of the interest in searching for candidate disease causing rare variants, which I just want to also add. Um, uh, he, he, this is something that Manish has kind of pioneered in, in immunology. He's been one of the pioneers in that he's identified rare variants in patients that have changed their therapy, including a beautiful paper recently in New England Journal of Medicine on, on a COXI um, treatment. So, so I urge you to take a look at that. So there really is uh, something pretty um, extraordinary here, I think, and, and I, I'm excited to see his findings. Thank you, Manish. Thanks, I'm Dan. Gonna... Okay, so I'm gonna take about 10 minutes uh, so that we leave some time for Q&A, 10, 12 minutes, to talk about now the flip side, the rare disease side, uh, which is to say uh, single genes, perhaps, that uh, in a small number of individuals could explain their extreme phenotype. Um, and let me just make sure the slides advance. Yes, okay. So here philosophically is what we're really trying to get after in terms of which patients are we really gonna, um, gonna sequence. Um, as Dan mentioned, we're gonna, we, we have an effort here to sequence everybody, uh, not just here, but across the whole University of California system to try to identify the common variants, the ones that uh, that initial GWAS um, of, of 500 or so patients uh, he's been showing you in the last few slides. Um, but with those same patients and those same data and armed with their phenotypes, we can uh, go one step further. 
into the heterogeneity of outcomes that I mentioned from the beginning and, and start to ask, for example, in the patients um, who are not old, so on this end of the scale, and for the ones who don't have diabetes, hypertension, obesity, et cetera, on this end of the comorbidity scale, the younger ones, the ones who have a more quote unquote idiopathic and severe disease outcome, we want to, we want to go after these patients to try to identify what their potential risk factors were, genetic risk factors were that led them to get sick. Uh, the reason that that's useful is because those pathways that show up in that kind of analysis give us incredibly important hints about how uh, our immune systems have weaknesses. And those weaknesses in these individuals through, the, through genetic variation end up with them getting very sick. Uh, and those weaknesses also are potential therapies and areas where we can use drugs, for example, to augment or alter pathways. The other end of the spectrum is up here. Hopefully you all can see my mouse. Uh, and, and I'm looking at the ones who are very old patients, you know, way over 50. <laughs> um, sorry, it's, the jokes don't, aren't really funny if I'm the only one left. And, um, and the ones with lots of comorbidities, the ones who have hypertension, diabetes, obesity, et cetera. Uh, and yet for those ones who get infection from SARS-CoV-2, well, what is it about them that keeps them from getting sick, keeps them from having a phenotype, keeps them from showing up in the hospital, keeps them from getting in the ICU? Uh, what is it that protects genetically those individuals? So we're calling this a resistance population and a susceptible population. And both of these may identify uh, immunological pathways that are of real importance then to identify with, which pathways when nature breaks them in these experiments of nature turn out to be so important for protecting us from COVID. Click, okay there. So there are two sort of approaches to actually figure out getting, and data, getting data on these patients and moving forward. One is the approach where you just take the sickest of the sick those ICU patients and grab them and sequence them. And this is the effort, uh, the approach taken in many countries as part of that international consortium that, that I, that we all are part of, uh, including for example, the way Belgium is approaching it, the way that Morocco is approaching it, the way that Saudi Arabia is approaching it, the way that most countries right now who have national healthcare infrastructures, uh, where the way they're approaching it is to, because they can already identify and coalesce their, their efforts, they're actually grabbing these sickest of the sick patients and getting them sequenced right from the get go. And there are about 500 of these patients in this international database right now, um, and around 2,000 more that are being processed right now from, a, from about 30 or 40 countries around the world. The other approach is the approach that we've taken here at UCLA and that the other UCs have taken as well, which is to sequence everybody. Just take everyone you can get your hands on, get your IRB, get your, you know, un, get, get your data, get your, get your samples and sequence everyone. And then afterwards go back using phenotype information, age information, et cetera, go back and try to actually look into uh, rare variants in the sickest of the sick and the ones who are the most severe, the ones who are resistant. Okay, so what are we going to look for in these patients genetically? What rare pathways uh, are the ones to look after? There are 20,000 genes. We're not gonna look at 20,000 things. It's too much to look for. Um, as those of you may know, all of us carry variants in all of our genes and it's a hopeless endeavor to actually think you're gonna find the answer just by having the sequence. We have to actually narrow our search uh, filter our search down into a certain set of genes. So which genes? Um, it helps to just remember the immunology a little bit that after uh, viral infections, respiratory viral infections and all viral infections, there is immediately an innate immune response. Uh, these are the pathways that are turned on by the epithelial cells that got infected themselves, by the uh, 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 dendritic cells that are living embedded in those tissues, picking up antigens, recognizing uh, patterns of infection and or damage of cells and turning on their defense mechanisms, uh, monocytes uh, that are living in those tissues all within the first few hours after infection. Uh, those dendritic cells very quickly migrate off and turn on the adaptive immune system, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the innate immune system will turn on its responses uh, to start fighting the viral infection right from the get-go. So these pathways that are turned on by these arrows are the ones that we'll look at uh, primarily to try to identify in those severe patients whether those genes bear rare variants that are damaging to the gene. Okay, so innate immune responses, you know, this is an area that Melody, uh, our generous host, uh, focuses her whole career on. And so, you know, far be it for me to say anything other than the most superficial uh, take on it, that is that viruses trigger, when they get into cells, certain sensor pathways that pick up the fact that the virus is in your cell. Uh, and for RNA viruses like SARS-CoV-2, there are three major conserved pathways that can be triggered as a result of an RNA making its way uh, into your cell 
uh, on, unwantedly. Uh, those pathways include RIG-I, uh, MDA5, and PLR3, toll-like receptor 3. Those three pathways are, are largely turned on by RNAs that have made their way, uh, viral RNAs that make their way into cells. And that RIG-I, MDA5, and TLR3 all turn on a conserved set of uh, downstream pathways, including TRAF3, uh, TRAF6, the IKK and NF-kappa B pathways, classical activation of NF-kappa B. And, and you heard about uh, NF-kappa B activation in Alex's talk at the very first talk of this lecture series. And then also the, um, some of the non-canonical activation, including TBK1, uh, that activates IRF3 and IRF7. These are all transcription factors in the end. They turn on transcriptional programs. And the transcriptional program that's most de defensive and most protective, it seems, for SARS-CoV-2 and also for respiratory viruses in general is type 1 interferons. Those interferons have to get sensed by a different cell, maybe by the same cell in an auto autocrine fashion, that turn on pathways that lead to stats being turned on, that turn on to an antiviral state. And those antiviral states are driven by a variety of um, interferon-stimulated genes, ISGs, uh, and these are the topics and the genes and the targets. All these things that you see on the slide are the things that we think you could break and cause a susceptibility to COVID. Um, and indeed, COVID has already figured that out. These, these buggers, these respiratory viruses in the, in the SARS family of viruses have built in into their evolutionary machinery uh, genes and pathways uh, that screw up these pathways that I just pointed to. For example, all the co uh, coronaviruses have a mechanism for uh, screwing with the detection of the virus by rig I, MDA5, and TLR3. I mentioned that these are the main sensors. Look at this, these viruses already have figured it out in the evolutionary arms race that is the battle between pathogens and us. Uh, they have already figured out how to screw with this stuff because they know this stuff is so important for recognizing that you've been infected. Or downstream of that, turning on TBK, I said was really important for turning on RF3 and RF7. There are, are built-in pathways into SARS and MERS that uh, screw with this particular mechanism. Probably those, those same pathways are conserved in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and similarly at the IRF3 level and similarly downstream of interferon uh, sensing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every one of these pathways that I said, gee, I bet these are gonna be important for recognizing the virus. Yes, they are important for the virus because the virus already figured this out and is already building machinery to block it. But you can actually make a prediction based on this. The prediction is that the most severe cases probably represent immune evasion where the virus has actually figured out how to screw with the, our own machinery to such an extent that they can build up such a viral load that by the time interferons are actually trying to slow down the, the, uh, the program, the antiviral state, uh, the, the virus is already spreading. And so um, that prediction has actually borne out in most recent weeks in the T cell and other um, literature that's been uh, published from John Wary and, and um, Shane Crotty and others. And I'm not gonna get into the immunology more because I'll spend an hour and I love this stuff. But, um, but I will tell you back to the, uh, from the innate side to the adaptive side, that those T cells are being turned on and those T cells help, especially the helper ones. B cells make uh, isotype switching to IgGs. Those are protective. The T cells themselves, the, uh, the cytotoxic T ones go, go into the lungs and kill virally infected cells from the draining lymph nodes. Uh, all of these pathways are also going to be potentially screwable, withable by COVID in terms of immune evasion or by genetic mutations uh, that may lead to poor clearance of the virus. And of course, there's a dysregulated immune response uh, in this process where if you don't clear the virus, when you get incomplete viral clearance, you may end up with um, elevations of inflammatory cytokines like type 1 interferons that at the early stage are defensive and at later stages are not so defensive and lead you to get, go to the ICU where you get ARDS, cytokine storm, vascular and capillary leakage into the lungs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what are these pathways? I've alluded to them, I've sort of shown you the cartoons. The pathways um, have been found for a variety of other respiratory and other viral infections, including for influenza. There've been a number of papers in the recent years showing those same transcription factors, IRF3, IRF7, IRF9, I didn't mention TLR3, uh, is on this list, all of uh, which show that influenza uses a conserved set of detection mechanisms. Uh, and when you screw with them on a rare genetic basis, you can end up with severe susceptibility to influenza, severe susceptibility to rhinovirus, severe susceptibility to the herpes simplex virus family of viruses, severe susceptibility to beta papilloma viruses, severe susceptibility to Epstein-Barr viruses. Many of these, by the way, are not uh, just innate pathways. ITK is a, a, a key kinase in T cells. Uh, MAGT1 is a magnesium transporter in T cells. And so, um, as I mentioned in these last few slides, either innate pathways of sensing and acting upon viral infection 
or T cell pathways about the effect or response, how to clear up this infection. If those are broken by rare genomic variants, then that's going to lead to susceptibility to COVID. That is our prediction. So far, there have been only a handful of papers that have actually looked at this. Oops, this is another cartoon. Um, in JAMA, about two months ago, uh, a group from the Netherlands published four, uh, two families, four patients from two families, where there was a loss of function in the uh, gene called TLR7. This is another viral sensing pathway uh, in, in uh, virtually every cell of your body. And they found uh, two families where this pathway was broken. Uh, a group in Boston Children's published just about a month ago, uh, two children who had not just severe COVID, but also the uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome that followed about a month after COVID. Uh, and they had uh, loss of function due to haploinsufficiency of SOX1, a pathway that's very important downstream of the interferon, gamma, uh, interferon alpha receptor. And just um, most recently, the coalition that, uh, that Dan mentioned that I'm part of the covid HGE effort has identified autosomal dominant and recessive variants in both chains of the interferon receptor in TLR3, in IRF3, in IRF7, and, uh, and these other genes, all of which showed up in the figures I just showed you. Uh, and so at this point, 23 patients of the 658 that have been analyzed thus far in this international coalition, about 3.5%, have been found uh, to carry, uh, these are of the severe patients, uh, have been found to carry uh, rare in, uh, genomic variants that are highly impairing of immune function. So, um, what does this mean? As I mentioned right from the beginning, the likelihood of finding uh, a slam dunk mutation that's going to explain why everyone gets fit, hit, and, and gets sick from this virus is not the goal of this half of the effort. Here, we're trying to identify the rare patients who have the most severe disease, uh, who don't have other explanations for why they got sick, and use those cases to learn about the pathways so we can actually come up with therapies for them uh, based on the pathways themselves. So what about UCLA? At UCLA, this is my last slide. Uh, the same slide, uh, the very young patients um, who don't have a lot of comorbidities, the very old patients who have um, resistance to infection. These are actually flipped around. Great, I'm sorry about that. Um, we started with 770 patients here at UCLA who are young and who have no other comorbidities. And you can see their age distribution here between uh, 18 and 50. We decided to select our range. Um, those patients of those 770 at UCLA uh, with not major comorbidities, about 33% actually got quite sick. They got admitted to the hospital, they needed therapies, et cetera. These 33 um, shouldn't have gotten sick, right, based on the comorbidities and the age sort of thing. And we're going to dive into them to try to understand if one of the rare variants in these interferon pathways or other pathways could explain why they got sick. Um, and, you know, we have, of course, self-identified race and ethnicity, as, as Dan showed you, and uh, these patients are about uh, more than half Hispanic or Latino. That fits also with our demographics of who got admitted, as Dan showed you, about half the patients at UCLA admissions who got admitted into the ICUs are Latino, uh, self-identified Latino. On the other side, the older patients who have a resistance to infection. Uh, we had, oh shoot, the text disappeared. A couple hundred patients of those who are over age 50 and who carry um, many of the major comorbidities, obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, et cetera, uh, and, and yet 187 of them did not get admitted, got the virus, have documentation of COVID-19 positivity by PCR, but they didn't end up needing any uh, extra care. And so we think that those patients might be part of this resistance phenotype. And so we're going to, we are um, getting genomes on them and to try to identify uh, what could explain why they haven't gotten sick. Okay, so I went really fast and I know Dan did too, and we wanted to leave some time to ask questions. Thank you all for your attention, but also I want to make sure that we emphasize, we do thank the patients uh, who are giving their cells and DNA and whatnot so that we can learn from them and we can try to help other people with these diseases. We would not be able to do this kind of research without them. Um, thank you. And let's get some questions, Melody. Great, thank you so much, Dan and uh, Manish. I think I already have a question in the chat room from Steve Packman. Great talks. Do the presenters think this genetic inquiry can be used to better understand COVID-19 syndrome or long haulers? That is those patients who continue to experience serious symptoms of infections seven to eight months after being defined as post-infection. Yes. Definitely yes. I would just emphasize to Steve and to others that um, the long haulers don't continue to have the infection. The infection is gone. Uh, those patients have an ongoing immune response uh, that leads them to have all kinds of things like fatigue, uh, brain fog, all kinds of very interesting and real phenomena. Uh, I would 
bet my bottom dollar that they don't ongoing have the infection. They have cleared the infection. Now they have a residual immune response to the infection that we definitely see in other infections too. And, uh, and it's super worthy of exploring, yes. Great, any other questions if you want to unmute yourself? And we hope that it would also identify those, for example, with a, who have a predisposition to neurologic or other, say, coagulopathies or other things as well. Those will be, I'm just not sure, those will be kind of secondary analyses in the larger consortium. Hi, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Hi. Can you hear me, Benish? This is Owen. Really. I can hear you. Yes, go ahead, Owen. You guys gave great talks, a lot to think about. Um, there's certainly um, prior infection with other coronaviruses among a portion of the population. Um, how would that turn up in your analysis of, and perhaps skew it, if it would take someone who survived a, a related coronavirus infection and have some partial cross immunity um, due to you know, reaction to not the spike protein, but to other internal proteins of the virus that are more highly conserved? Yeah, though, that's a great question. That certainly impacts, for example, those who are interested in looking, like, like myself, uh, antibody responses and T cell responses to COVID because you're going to potentially be confused by shared epitopes from those other coronaviruses. Um, we're not looking at T cells and we're not looking at antibodies in the study, we're looking at the genomes. And so you could ask um, if they survive those other coronaviruses, genomically, does that mean that they're more likely to have some sort of traits or common or rare variants that could explain why they survive? Maybe, it's a great question. Uh, certainly many of these patients who are dying of COVID and are surviving from COVID had flu as well. That's another uh, thing. And mm -hmm. I think Tim Chang in the, in the larger effort has been now making comparisons uh, uh, with patients who at UCLA, we have a huge flu co cohort here. We're able to look at those data uh, in flu as well. Uh, excellent question. I think at this point, we, we don't know. I would just point out that the other common seasonal respiratory coronaviruses are rarely fatal, even among the highly immunodeficient mm -hmm. patients. We do know of patients with IFI H1 deficiency who die of rhinovirus, even a, even a milder virus. And right. so um, certainly it is possible in these pathways that we, I was just talking about that you can find susceptibilities uh, even to the common, you know, runny nose kind of viruses, yes. Uh, and so maybe uh, if we did know of a previous patient who died of common uh, coronaviruses, we would love to study them. Um, and please don't let any patient get sick and die in our world without us sequencing them, uh, is the take home. No. Any patient. Who has That's any take home message that all, all, all patients deserve to be sequenced, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I mean, all patients with the phenotype. All patients with the phenotype, yeah. Well, okay. I mean, no, I should say, at one level, as genome sequencing compared to the cost of everything else goes down, if you think about how many hundreds or thousands of dollars a medical center spends on, you know, even, even uh, on marketing to get each patient, if you now, you know, once genomes get to be around $200, $150, you can imagine if you had this information already, we could have already done half these studies. One would be able to be very, very nimble in doing this. So I suspect that as the cost goes down, this is going to become, it's going to be part of the patient's passport as they, as they yeah, go around. At the, risk, at the risk of oversimplifying the cost too much, I would just say, you know, with the Nova Seek 6,000, the price per genome is solidly under $1,000. We're typically doing them for about 700 bucks uh, right now. And exomes are about $240. So really less than one month of Advair, for those of you on asthma, who have asthma, <laughs> take little inhalers. But one month of one inhaler is the price of an exome at this point. I wish insurance companies would see it that way, but they don't. Okay. Sounds like you guys are campaigning for a grant renewal. I don't know. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks to your generosity. Well, you know, um, <laughs> doing this work and we will ask for more money. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we have two well, more questions. You. We have two more questions for the speaker. Uh, one from Janet Winnikoff. Are you comparing your database to normal uninfected patients? Both. We do, in terms of the stuff, uh, we do both. We take uninfected patients uh, who were tested and negative. Um, we also, I mean, so there's a bunch of different analyses. There's the COVID positive, severe versus not severe, like hospitalized ICU, et cetera. There's the positive versus negative. And that is positive versus negative in terms of those who have been tested. And then there's positive versus the whole population of non-positive patients, including those who haven't been tested, but who also aren't positive. So all of this. 
Great. Uh, and the next question is from Julian Martinez. How do you control for comorbidities, which are highly overrepresented in severe cases when performing a GWAS? Right. Um, um, yeah, exactly. that's a lockdown question, question. But, but I can try to answer a little bit. We, we, we um, use ICD codes. The ICD codes are converted to something called fee codes. This is a more generalized and uh, less, um, slightly less nuanced view of billing codes converting to actual phenotypes. Those fee codes themselves uh, can very quickly be screened with a, with standard sort of SQL queries to then filter on age and how many. No, we're not filtering. You know, Manish in the GWAS that we did, so we don't actually. One can filter and pick matched groups, right? With you know people, um, you know, which is reasonable but lowers your power because it lowers your numbers. Um, what we do is is it's a logistic regression, and those become um, um, you know variables um, in in in. In their aggression, and they get put in, and they're and they're uh, ac accounted for in that way. And so, what we're what what we get out is a data value. Great, thank you, Manisha. You want to add anything else? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, just, I think again, <laughs> like this, this reflects the two efforts. It's very well. The common disease side uses um, those aspects as variables to put in with coefficients in front of them and normalize around them. And the rare disease side filters those people out, the ones with the common stuff, and we go for the rare thing. So yeah, we just, it's, it's an amazing part of this collaboration that we can take the same groups of patients and slice them in two different ways. Totally. Highly complimentary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I guess um, if there are no other questions, I want to just squeeze in one last question. Oh, maybe Jason, you have a question? Um, yeah. So for Manish, the results you were showing for the um, exome, what was like the statistical test used to associate those genes because some of the sample sizes seemed small. You no were... statistics. This is done by biochemistry. So they find a kid who's really sick, they find a variant, they recreate that variant in a cell line, they show that the signaling is broken. So it's, um, it's the validation is done by a biochemical or immunological test. It's painstaking. Uh, in, in, in a re previous world, these kinds of validational tests to take this variant in this sick kid and say, oh, this is the cause of your sickness would take about two years. Uh, in the COVID time frame, everything's accelerated. Um, so we are starting to see the first results, but, uh, and, and all the results you saw are all pathways we know and love. Like Melody could close her eyes and list every one of those genes because she knows those pathways so well. Uh, to find a new pathway, a new gene in a new, in a new pathway that's the cause of COVID will be two years from now, you're gonna see that paper come out because it just takes forever to do the biochemical technical validation around this gene and its variant and what effect it has on the innate immune system and on B cells, et cetera. It's just painstakingly slow. No statistics. It's N equals one. But, but you showed a long list of genes for the consortium you were part of. So they were able to do this? It's super painful. That's why we do oh. filtering. And then we look for families and we just do our best. It is um, super painful. And, and the clinical fellows are on the call know every week we do these um, for the patients we see at UCLA, not just COVID, but all the sick patients. And it's a lot of work. It takes days per patient. So I don't know how we're going to do thousands. We're going to invent a little bit of a new capability. Dan already and I have talked about this and Bogdan. And we're just yeah, I mean, we'll probably use kind of like the idea of, of, of kind of network burden. And, you know, we'll look for gene burden if it gets large enough. But the but I think Manisha's point is very well taken. Uh, even in the larger uh, rare variant studies that are published in you know, things I work on like autism and Alzheimer's, nobody actually does an association test. One is looking at the kind, you know, it's not a strict like chi-square kind of test, like I right? it's a, um, you're looking at um, um, uh, genes that are really, really highly constrained. And so you're looking at the rate in the general population of disrupting mutations in those proteins, for, you know, and, and, and so there might be low hanging fruit, right? Like, a protein disrupting mutation. So we'll look, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a funnel that takes and goes, okay, let's take these highly constrained, really key genes to these signaling pathways. Our funnel will be focused on protein disrupting mutations, things that change the splice site that lead to nonsense mediated decay or predicted, et cetera. Then there'll be potential damaging missense mutations, right? Those kind of things are compound heterozygotes and those kind of things where the gene is essentially predicted to be minimally functional or almost totally knocked out. You know, we'll start with, with that. But then it takes Manisha's secret sauce of, of being expert on the pathways, and, you know, and thinking about it. 
um, you know, without kind of protein structure and understanding these these protein, you know, machines better and some of them, it's 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 very tough. Melody, go ahead. You had a question. <laughs> and then now we have another question. Okay, I'll try to make mine short. Um, I guess uh, just thinking about the mutations in the interferon pathway, it's really interesting and unique in the COVID context that you know you you talked about how usually those genetic variants are. Uh, mutations that make the pathway not work as well, right? But then in the second study you showed about SOX1 mutations, um, I quickly pull up the abstract. I mean, it seems like it's actually um, enhancing, right? The That's right. Because, because when SOX1 doesn't work as a negative regulator, you actually have more interferon. So what do you think is um, sort of- And the phenotype fit, by the way, there, that, that, the phenotype right. of those patients was the extraordinary amounts of inflammation, exactly. Right. I guess what I'm wondering is that, you know, what do you think, um, what, are, what do you think are the factors that might hinder or review some of these mutations? Because in this case, it's quite complex that you think that if you have better interferon response at the beginning, early on, right, after infection, you should actually be better at, at fighting the, the infection but then you could increase your risk of getting these multi-organ hyperinflammation. Like, do you think the cohort might be the most important thing in terms of how you find these mutations? Um, Finding them is one thing, but I think you're, you know, at the risk of pandering directly to you. <laughs> the, the, the only way to really dissect these rare mutations for their biological relevance is to understand the underlying biology. For example, this ISG is an early ISG. This ISG is a late ISG. Aha, that's why late interferon is so bad and early interferon is so good. Unless you know the patterns of all these ISGs, when, when they're turned on, when they're supposed to be turned off, when they are actually turned off, until you actually know that stuff like, like you do, um, we're not really going to be able to find new ones. So far, that's why I've been saying the ones that we found thus far are ones that are actually pretty well understood. They have been the cause of other rare diseases like uh, susceptibility to influenza or herpes viruses, et cetera. So a little bit enough is known about them that the people are going to be like, yeah, that, that smells right. I and mean, we're going to put that, we're going to publish a paper about that. But I think to go on to the next level of new genes that, you know, we hope to find in our 500 or, you know, soon thousand patients, um, we're going to need your help. <laughs> Cool. And I mean, I guess lots of interesting uncharacterized ISGs too, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. We all start with I though. I F or I F. So I think we're, we'll at least be able to spell her by name. Okay. Who's the, you had one other question. All right. One more question and then we'll relieve the, we have an excellent audience that is still staying on. So um, last question is from Man uh, Manelli uh, Mata. Have you seen similarities between your GWAS studies uh, results and published GWAS studies, particularly ones in regard to infections that inhibit the interferon response? Dan, GWAS study, question for you. Yeah, can you repeat that? Just, I just kind of missed, it. it kind of came in and out with my internet, sorry. No problem. Have you seen similarities between your GWAS studies and the published GWAS studies, particularly ones that uh, inhibit an interferon response. So I imagine the negative regulators that we've been talking about. Yeah, we haven't looked you know, at a locus by locus uh, uh, thing, but uh, actually um, um, since we just got the GWAS done last week, that's actually being done right now. Uh, the graduates at Ruthie who led that, there was so much, uh, she took uh, a few days off. She's been working around the clock to get all of that done. And so you know, perhaps next week, We'll have that, but that's an essential part of the analysis, right? We want to show that in general, the effect sizes that we're seeing in our European population, even though they're not genome-wide significant, match what's been observed in other populations. And so, um, you know, all of that kind of QC will go on as, uh, you know, as, as these studies uh, progress. Um, so, but a great question. That's an essential uh, kind of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, reality check in a way. Great, thank you, Dan. I think we have a raised hand from Rita. Rita, do you want to unmute yourself? Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, this is uh, actually probably more for Manish. Um, 
it's been hypothesized that the HLA polymorphisms that have been driven over many years have really been driven by viral infections and the, the, the uh, haplotypes that survived, survived and didn't die out. And so I'm wondering if you have any insights into possible effects of um, HLA variants that might play into the whole thing and not only the variants, but perhaps how they might bind more better or worse to the viral peptides. Right, so uh, two questions there. One is HLA, and it turns out that HLA, uh, the first part of your question is very much related to the common aspect of HLA. Uh, many HLA types are actually shared. There's only 30 or 50 you know, worldwide ones that, that make up 50, 70% of all people. Um, and so believe it or not, the effort comes from the SNP genotyping and what's called, uh, and maybe Bogdan can in, uh, unmute and help us understand this, but there's a process called imputation of HLA types where you can actually get HLA typing from some of these data. Uh, that sort of will help answer your first part of your question. Can we identify which LH types lead to susceptibility to infection or not? Uh, yes. The second part of your question has to do with the binding of peptides, uh, viral peptides, presumably, that, that then activate the immune response. Uh, and uh, at that level, you're talking about now individual level uh, HLA types. Those are the nuance, the business end of the HLA and how it holds on to peptides. Uh, and those may be um, very, very different one person to the next. Um, there are efforts right now to sequence T cell receptors and B cell receptors in these patients. Um, and of course, um, identifying which peptides of the pathogen turn out to be immunodominant will help us identify whether they can bind to certain HLA types more than others. That particular thinking has been part of vaccine design. Uh, and I know many of the vaccine uh, approaches out there are using exactly that information. Uh, identification of the immunodominant peptides and the pathogen, identifying and by HLA computational screening, which HLAs will they bind to the best, and using those together as your vaccine. Uh, that, that's being done. I don't know um, what the outcomes of that are yet. I think it's, at least for me, I, I don't know the answer beyond that point. Dan or Bogman, do you guys want to comment on the broader HLA question about are there broader HLA types that you can impute as being protective or, or not? I think it's a, yeah, I, I'm not a, I think that's what I know. I'd love to hear Bogdan's oh, thought. Bogdan uh, immediately logged off once he heard me ask. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, um, HLA is notoriously hard to impute in many areas, um, but one can do it. We might need denser genotyping. And so it may be doable mm -hmm. with, you know, I think we'll do better in those that we sequence for that. Um, okay. There's a lot of structural variation and other things that aren't well measured, you know. I'm definitely not an expert in this area, so it's a little, but, but what I do know is that maybe somebody else who's on the call on this, like, uh, I don't know, Jason Ernst or, or anybody Jerry else Robert. knows, but um, very hard. Yeah, so sequence is, is probably the best we'll do. Uh, you want me to comment, Dan? Sure. Yeah, so... Uh, yes, increasingly, um, uh, certainly with sequencing, you can. Uh, there's now uh, uh, papers out that increasingly allow finer and finer uh, in inference of HLA types. But even in the absence of that, uh, the GWAS is sufficiently fine. So if if you ought to be seeing signals in the region from GWAS, and uh, up till now nobody's emphasized that as a result. So I'm not saying that HLA is not going to be involved as we as we get bigger and bigger samples, but it doesn't have the at this stage, the uh, the signals that, that have been uh, thus far revealed uh, from uh, the existing consortiums. Great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all the uh, great progress, by the way. And and a good demonstration of what happens if you as you say Thanks if you have a good exciting. infrastructure. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dan and Manish, for such a stimulating presentation and discussion. I think we have like more questions than ever today. <laughs> so this is what we would like to do with this series. So, and I guess I will see everyone next week on Wednesday. That will be our last Wednesday COVID seminar. After that, we'll start. Um, we'll switch to the Friday noon uh, times. So, thanks, Melody. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dan. Yeah. And nice. thanks, Manish. Yeah. Really. Thank you, Manish. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Bye bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. -bye.
Bye. <laughs>